We give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So, you all showed up for that Sunday. That Sunday where we're talking about money. Uh, <clears throat> so, I- I'm going to say this about that. We don't need your money. Okay? I don't know if you've ever noticed, like, we make a really not big deal about money. Um, we're really trusting God. So, I share this message with you, not for our benefit, for your benefit. You do with it whatever God tells you to do. Make sense? Okay, we're kind of clear on that. Okay, so money's a touchy subject, right? And, uh, and yet, it's something that Jesus talked a tremendous amount about. In Scripture, we see Jesus commending the woman who gives her last penny to God. In the, in the offering box at the temple. We see Jesus challenging the idolatry of the rich young ruler. We see uh, Jesus, when he's questioned about paying taxes, we see him instruct his disciples to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And he shows them the coin. It has Caesar's picture on it. That's Caesar's. Give it to him. But he implies then that we should give God what belongs to God. And whose image are we made in? God's. God, we belong to him. So, there are parables about investing the gifts that God gives us and not wasting them. Jesus also indicates that it's very difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not, he doesn't say it's impossible, but he does say it's easier for a rich man to get, to get, it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. So, we got a challenge in front of us, if, if that's the case, Right? Jesus doesn't go so far as to say that money is evil, but he does point out that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Okay, So just some interesting statements from Jesus. And just like every other area of life, we don't get to separate finances from our relationship with Jesus. We don't get to go, oh, Jesus, don't look over there. Right? Jesus, you don't need to see what's in my wallet or my bank account or my 401k or, you know, any of that stuff, what my credit card statement looks like. We really can't do that. That's, that's not what it looks like to live for Jesus. If we're living for Jesus, we're also going to be using our resources in a way that honors him. So today we're talking about investing for Jesus, and we've got a really interesting parable that we're going to be working through. If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to flip over to Luke chapter 16. And, uh, and I, I'll just say this about this parable tough. Um, I've been preaching now for over 22 years. I've never used this parable in a sermon. And I've preached parables. Um, So, you know we're in for a doozy. (laughs) It's complicated. Uh, Let's just start by, as we're going to walk through this this passage, and as we walk through the passage, there we go, here we go, Uh, we're just going to make some observations as we go, okay? Luke chapter 16, starting with verse 1. Now, he was also saying to the disciples, this is Jesus saying, there was a rich man who had a manager, and this manager was reported to him as squandering his possessions. And he called him, and he said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. So, we just make an observation right out of the gate. We have a rich man. We have a financial manager. At this time, that was a common practice, okay? Jesus doesn't need to give a ton of detail to his disciples as he says there's a manager, like everybody knows what that looks like. For us, it might be comparable to like a financial planner, okay? There's someone who is authorized to make financial decisions on on behalf of someone else to handle their accounts, to move money around, to make sure things are happening the way they should be happening. In this case, the manager was not doing a good job. And worse than just being neglectful, it wasn't like he was just kind of checked out. He was actually being wasteful. Wasting funds would be reminiscent of what we see in the story of the prodigal son one chapter before Luke chapter 16, right? Where the prodigal son's like, give me my inheritance, then he goes out and spends it on wild living. Okay, so that same word of being wasteful, not a good picture, okay? 
Clearly, this manager was not using the funds he was entrusted with to enrich his master. Maybe people had seen him out partying. It doesn't say exactly, but clearly the intention here is to say that something unethical is happening. So we have a rich man and we have a manager. Something unethical has gone down. And as a result, the rich man decides it's time to turn everything in and the manager is done. So there's consequences that start happening. For the manager, that would normally mean a, a number of things. The loss of income, probably also the loss of housing, right? Because usually your manager lived on your property in one of your houses. And then also, if you're skimming money, you obviously lose the opportunity to keep skimming money, right? So loss all the way across the board for the manager. And this is not going well for him. Verse 3. The manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. Digging and begging, like that's the bottom of the, bottom of the barrel right there in, in, in Jewish society. Very undignified professions. Uh, so the manager might have been a thief, but everyone has their limits. <laughs> right? <laughs> I can't beg, and I can't dig. Uh, so knowing that his future is in jeopardy and that he'll soon be homeless, the manager leverages the only thing left at his disposal. The resources are leveraged. Here's what happens, verse 4. I know what I shall do, so that when I am removed from the management, people will come, will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors. And he began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measure of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. Now, these debts were typically due after harvest. And in the case of the hundred measures of oil, we're talking about that, that portion that would be turned in would be about 150 trees worth of olive oil, okay? That's about two years of wages for a single person, a single individual. And so with the wheat, we're talking about the yield of about 100 acres. Now, 100 acres when you don't have a combine is a lot of acres, Right? So we're talking about five years' worth of wages is what was owed there. Now, in both cases, the reduction of that ended up being about 500 denarii. These payments, of course, were only a portion of what was owed to the rich man, this deduction, but it was a year's wages were just chopped off. Uh, and so everyone involved in this story, besides the manager, is pretty well off. Right? you got a lot of wealthy people here. And, and the manager is the exception. The amount that's being forgiven, though, is substantial, and it could be adjusted on paper with minimal marking of the paper. So think about it like this. It's like, it's like moving a decimal point over in our mathematics. Right? It's like we can just erase that little thing and put another bigger dot there. That's the kind of adjustments that they were making. Interesting enough, this idea of having a reduction of your bill was actually something that was occasionally done by a particularly wealthy landowner, especially when times were lean for the people who were under him. So in order to keep other people afloat, the, the wealthy landowner would sometimes reduce the amount owed and basically write it off as a loss. Okay? This is what makes this so devious, is that this would explain why no one questions the manager, right? The manager goes, hey, just write down 80. That, that's good. And everyone would go, well, you have the authority. Awesome. This is fantastic. So what's the master supposed to do when he discovers this problem? People are already ecstatic with the generosity that he has shown them. Is he going to go back now and, and renege on the whole thing? I mean, he would go from looking very generous to looking very stingy and as if 
things are kind of out of control in his personal life, right? So he would have a mess on his hands real quick. So in a shocking, in a, in a shocking twist, Jesus says, verse 8, it says, and his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. Now, the master, yeah, huh. The, the, the master praises the manager not because he did something ethical, but because he got the best of him. He got better of him. Something the master had probably done to dozens of people. I mean, there's a good chance these are all kind of unethical folks flocking together. And so Jesus is saying that everyone involved in this whole situation is they're worldly. But this manager has been careful to arrange some form of secure future for himself with the resources available to him. So this manager is forward thinking, right? In that regard, Jesus is saying that worldly people might be wiser than those following him. See why this is something that gets preached a ton, <laughs> right? Clearly, Jesus cannot be suggesting that he wants his followers to steal from someone so that they can have friends when things get hard, right? Not the moral of the story. It can't be, right? It's ethically not, doesn't fit with anything else in Scripture, but Jesus does make this, this puzzling statement, and this verse 9 seems to be kind of the linchpin of the whole thing. Jesus says, and I say to you, so now he's talking to his disciples again, make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness, so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. What does that mean? It could sound like Jesus is saying that we should use worldly riches to make friends so that when money means nothing and we die, we have people who can get us into heaven. But that's not what it means. <laughs> right? That would be a very poor uh, understanding of the rest of Scripture, right? A very, very poor theology based on one random verse. So what does it mean? Well, Jesus is using this worldly example to teach a spiritual lesson. Many times before Jesus has taught this idea that we are managers or stewards of the blessings of God, right? Everything we have comes from Him. It's all His. So we can be shrewd. How can we be shrewd as children of the light? Because the idea here is being shrewd or being wise or being forward-thinking. How can we be shrewd? Uh, the lesson that Jesus begins to unpack, they're, they're important when it comes to using the resources that God has given us to be used for his kingdom. So, number one, as we start to get a better understanding of this, number one, we should use money to win people to Christ. This is the idea. If, if a wicked servant could use resources of his master to earn them both goodwill, shouldn't we be able to use what God gives us to impact people for Jesus? Now, imagine if there could be hundreds of people in heaven because of how you used the resources God gave you. That would be pretty exciting. Obviously, the difference in that situation is they would not be there welcoming you of, like, they get to decide, right? That's not how it works. People you bless can't get up to heaven and go, hey, God, God, he was nice. Let him in. <laughs> right? But they can be there because of the impact that you had on them and be a welcome party for when God says, you're in. Right? There can be a celebration at your arrival because of the people who have gone before you that you impacted. That is a possibility. And that's a beautiful thing. 
And I think that may be one of the most exciting parts about getting to heaven. Not, not that I'm not diminishing the fact that Jesus is there and you're in the presence of God. But second to that might be the excitement over, look at the impact my life had. Because so many times we don't really know the impact that we've had. But can you imagine people coming up to you for all eternity going, let's connect the dots. You did this, that did this, that connected to this person, and that's the person that led me to the Lord. Pretty awesome, pretty awesome time of fellowship, I'm thinking. The point where our lives intersect could change everything. And that's the amazing thing about how God is working. So you might be sitting here saying, you know, I don't really have money to do that, to, to have an impact. I don't really have money to invest in God's kingdom. And the good news is that is not the only resource God has given you, right? He's also given you time, and he's given you talents and abilities. And you can use those in other people's lives to have an impact for God's kingdom. You never know what might happen if you see something as simple as someone seems to be hurting and you just stop and care about them and offer to pray for them. It can turn a life upside down. So are you willing to invest what God has given you into his kingdom? That's the real question. I know there are so many good causes out there. There's so many good things that we can be a part of it can get overwhelming, right? I mean, there's Christians out there doing natural disaster relief, probably right now. There are Christian organizations uh, that, that need funds to help starving children and rescue uh, you know, people from human trafficking. There are Christian organizations on the front line trying to love and support abortion-minded people and give them the opportunity to choose life. There are so many fronts on which the battle is being fought. The only real question is, are we, doing, are we engaging for the kingdom or just for humanitarian aid? Because saving someone's life but ignoring their soul, kind of missing the mark. But there's lots of ways we can be involved even locally with food banks and you know, resale shops and the mission downtown. And there, there's tons of places where we can plug in and serve if we don't have a specific spot. When you stop and think about it, this has been the way of Christians for a long, long time. Long, long time. If you were to do, go dive into the history of almost every major university in our country, they were almost all founded by Christians trying to have an impact on the kingdom of God in people's lives. And the same thing is true with almost every hospital. So, is there something you know God has called you to support but you're hesitating. I want to challenge you to take that step of faith and trust God. I, I love one of the things Pastor Frank said when he was here a couple weeks ago. He pointed out that when we trust God, then God can trust us. Right? So, if someone is, this is another thing that Jesus is pointing out here as we keep going, if someone is faithful in money, then God can trust them with more. Look at, as we continue in, in uh, Luke 16, look down at verse 10 as Jesus starts to kind of do some teaching out of this parable. He says in verse 10, He who is faithful in very little things is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in very little things is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give that which is your own? What Jesus is essentially saying here is that money and possessions are not really the greatest form of wealth. Remember, Jesus also said in Matthew 6, not to store up for ourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves cannot break in and steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The stuff that we think matters, the stuff that we work so hard to accumulate, 
can slip through our fingers very, very quickly, right? A major health problem and your money is going to be gone. It can be millions of dollars. A, a major catastrophe like a fire or a flood, which we're seeing lots of those these days, and all those precious things are gone. If we're investing in the kingdom of heaven, then not, nothing can touch that investment. There are no heavenly stock market crashes. It's pretty awesome. So when we begin using God's resources for what He cares about, then He will give us more opportunities. And I've always been amazed by the people who just keep giving. I don't know if you've ever heard stories like I've heard where you have somebody that's like, I started sponsoring children and I just kept adding another one and now I sponsor 30 children every month at $35 a month. What? Right? Or, or I, I met a guy who like assembles 400 shoe boxes for Samaritan's Purse every year himself. He said, I just kept going. God kept providing, so I kept giving. It's pretty awesome. Now, maybe for you, the first step is just to begin tithing. It, and I say first step, but that's a huge first step. I know that it is. It's terrifying to think I can live on 10% less than what I make right now, right? I just know this. God makes it work. I don't know how. In my life, it seems like not giving 10% would be the dumbest financial decision I could ever make because somehow God pours it back into my life. God has returned that little 10% so many thousand times over, it's ridiculous. And when I'm responsible for making ends meet on my own and I'm not trusting God, it doesn't go well. When I trust God, He has resources beyond what I can possibly imagine. The hard part is the trust part. To take that step of faith. But learning to live by faith is scary at first. After you do it a while, you see there's growth in that process. And if giving 10%, you're like, yeah, I already do that. I don't know, that's not a stretch. Like, well, I've been doing that for my whole life. And there's some of you here that probably could say that. What if you were to do something different beyond that? And this is what I'm talking about. When I was a kid, I was at a church that they did something called faith promise. Maybe you've heard of that. Maybe you've never heard that term. But this is what it looked like. You would pray for God to show you a need. And then you would pray for God to show you how much you were to give irrelevant of how much you had. And then you would trust his provision to give you that amount so you could give it. It was the craziest thing, right? So you'd be like, God, I, I see that. That needs to be addressed. And, and God, how much do you want me to give? And you know, you might sense God saying, you know, give $1,000. You're like, Lord, I don't have $1,000. You would trust that God was going to give you $1,000 so you could give it. It's pretty, pretty epic. Now, so you're not talking about, like, you're talking about money coming in, surprising you, that's over and above your salary, right? So you're not saying, God, I'm going to scrimp and save this. You're going, God, you surprise me on how you give to me, and I'm going to give that to you, whatever project you put on my heart. You want to talk about growing in faith? It will blow your mind how fast that money comes in. If you've never had money just show up in your mailbox, try out Faith Promise. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's pretty awesome. And, and if God doesn't provide it, don't give it. But if God does provide it, don't you hold it back. Can you imagine what God might do in a community full of people living like that? Looking to invest in the kingdom of heaven looking to make an eternal impacts. I want to ask you today, would you prayerfully consider taking some kind of step there? To step out and go, I'm going to try tithing. 
Or I'm going to try, I, I'm already tithing. I'm going to try that faith promise thing. I'm going to see how God leads. But let God lead and guide you and let God show up. And it truly is amazing. If he doesn't, it didn't cost you anything, right? Especially that faith promise thing. It literally cost you nothing. If God doesn't send the money, you don't have to do anything. But try it. See what happens. You could be a channel of God's blessing in the lives of people around you. You could be making an eternal difference with something as simple and basic as money. If that's where you're investing, then that's where you will be obsessing. And this is what Jesus points out in verse 13. You can't worship two things, right? Jesus says in verse 3, No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You know, the easiest way I've found to cure an obsession with money is to give it away. <laughs> if you're like, I can't stop worrying, then give it away. I mean, not all of it. I'm not saying go destitute. But start giving. Start giving and find out how quickly you're worrying less about money. It's crazy how it works. I mean, just simple things. What if, what if you put a $10 bill in your pocket and you said, I'm not going to spend this $10 bill, but when God shows me where I'm going to use it, I'm going to use it. It could be really a fun experiment, right? Um, when, I, when I was a kid, my, my parents had a thing, and I don't remember where they got this idea or how they came up with it, but it, it, was, it was based off of the Bible story of Elijah. There's a Bible story where Elijah has a, he, he's working, helping a widow out. And he goes, go collect as many pots as you can find, empty pots, and bring them here. And she, because she had said, I have this little bit of oil, we're going to make a cake, and then that's it, we're dying. It was a famine. And he goes, gather all the pots you can find, all the empty pots. And he starts pouring out the oil. And, uh, and, and it just keeps going, and keeps going, and keeps going. The little bit of oil fills all these vessels was more than enough. It was a miracle. And my parents took that idea and they, they had a thing, uh, an account that they made, a bank account called, that they called Elisha's Barrel. And every month they would put a little bit of money in Elisha's Barrel. And then they would wait for God to show them a need. And they always just trusted that whatever was in there was enough. And they would give whatever they felt led by God to give. It was a pretty neat thing. A lot of different ideas on ways you can invest in God's kingdom and be ready to do so. Now, say all that to say this. If you happen to be listening today and thinking to yourself, this sounds ridiculous. You've got company. Okay? Um, the, the story's not quite over yet. Uh, the thing I will say before we read verse 14 is you might not like the company that you get to be with. Uh, but this is Jesus talking, and I'm not putting words in his mouth. So, verse 14 says, now, now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. But God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Bottom line, our greed, our selfishness, probably at times our extravagance, these things don't really fit in the life of someone living for Jesus. That's not what it looks like to be an investor in the kingdom. One of my favorite quotes of all time came from Mother Teresa who said this, let us live simply so that others may simply live. It's profound. It's simple. But keep this in mind. We're not talking about a specific threshold here. We're, we're not talking about becoming legalistic and being able to judge each other. Okay? This is not the time where you go, I know somebody who needs to do some more giving. 
That's between them and God, right? This is between you and God. We're not called to legalism. We're not called to judge each other. What we are called to do is to allow Jesus to have his way in us. Whatever that looks like. Could be a lot, could be a little. Could be a lot more as we learn to trust him. But at the end of the day, this parable comes down to this. If worldly people can figure out that investing in the future is smart, shouldn't children of the light be investing in eternal things? Are you investing for Jesus? Is there a way he wants to stretch you more? It's between you and him. If you ask, he'll show you. And your faith will grow in the process. That's what makes this about really you, you, your faith walk. I'm not sharing this to have anything to do with church. I want to see you grow in your faith. I'm not even saying give here. Grow in your faith. Invest in the kingdom. Trust Jesus more. Lord God, we thank you for the the challenge that we can find in your word. There's so many things that are hard at times for us to hear, but critically important to our growth in relationship with you. You're, You're not over here worrying and obsessing about money, but you also recognize the hold that it can have on us and the the havoc that it can wreak in our lives. So as with everything, your desire is that we would be free. Free to follow you. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to release that strangle grip we have on money. Lord, that we would learn to trust you and learn to see that you are our provider. It, it's important that we work hard. <laughs> it's important that we represent you well. But it's also important that we trust you for our daily bread. And that we would grow in that trust. Grow in that relationship. Lord, we pray that if there are those that you're calling here today to take a bigger step of faith in trusting you financially, Lord, that you would do what you promised to do and show up. Lord, that we would be in awe. <laughs> that, Lord, that there would be stories upon stories of the ways that you have showed up and given what we couldn't give (laughs) so that we could give. (laughs) Lord, we want to have an impact on your kingdom. I pray that this body, this community would be one focused on your kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.